Thank you so much uh, to all of you for uh, being here and being part of this fantastic summit. Uh, thank you for that fantastic in, uh, introduction. And uh, thank you, A Society, for inviting me out here to do this presentation. Uh, as much as anything else, an exclamation point, I think, on a fantastic day uh, in which we've seen corporate America really, as I was telling uh, uh, the fine staff here, for the first time standing up and recognizing and, and speaking out uh, the reality that diversity has a business case, that we are here not simply to speak to a message or a, a political need or uh, even a historical set of milestones, but rather the very real opportunities for growth, for creativity, for innovation, uh, for social change, yes, but also for uh, corporate profits, let's be honest here, right, that are inherent in the fact that the fastest growing markets in America, the largest opportunities in the world represent the kind of diversity you see in this very room. Now, my introduction, uh, again, was fantastic, especially since uh, it reflects the fact that I literally changed my job within the last two weeks. <laughs> so I was at the Futures Company, and a lot of the work you'll see here, actually, uh, comes from the work I did at the Futures Company. But my life has changed dramatically over just the past uh, 18 to 24 months. And uh, what that primarily did was move me to Los Angeles, not because of my career, but because of the career of my my son, my elder son, uh, whose name is Hudson Yang, <laughs> and who is the star of ABC's Fresh Off the Boat. Uh, until you've actually had your entire life defined by, uh, by your offspring. <laughs> Something which those of us who are Asian parents, of course, you know, we, we, we know how that is already. But this is a particularly special case. And uh, the reason why I, I highlight that is because the conversation I'm going to have with you today is about how popular culture ultimately is, in fact, defining the, the range of changes that all of us face, regardless of the industry and category that we're seeing, because ultimately, popular culture is like a trailing indicator for the culture itself, for society itself. What I mean by that is that media, entertainment, films, movies, you know, uh, TV, the internet these days, are a reflection of the mores of America. And when you see something appearing on network primetime or in a, a big you know, theater marquee, uh, you can kind of recognize that it reflects uh, the fact that America, and maybe the world, is ready to embrace that thing. You know, kids with two fathers, right? Uh, Transracially adopted kids, interracial relationships, uh, you know, an actual Asian family that speaks English and that is, lives in America on network primetime TV. All these things are, are kind of you know, benchmarks of change. And they're benchmarks that take a little, a little while longer, essentially, to work themselves into our, our broader consciousness. But when they do, they show up on TV. And when they've shown up on TV, well, it's almost a little bit late for corporate America to start recognizing and embracing them. So what I want to talk about in, in my presentation is about what pop culture says about what we call the polycultural future. Now, polycultural is a term that you probably haven't heard today at all, except reading through the, perhaps, catalog, <laughs> the, uh, the program for today's event. Uh, and uh, when, it, when we talk about the polycultural future, what we're trying to do is we're trying to go beyond the existing conversations that exist around diversity and multiculturalism. Uh, when we talk about the polycultural future, we're talking about a reality uh, which usually people peg to the 2040s, to 2050, right? 2042 is supposed to be the pivot year when America becomes a majority-minority U.S. population. In fact, by 2050, we're expected to, to have, uh, for the first time, a population which is 53% non-white, 53% African American, Hispanic, or Asian American, right? And Native American and, and other and mixed, et cetera. Um, but beyond that, what we'll be seeing is, is that American identity itself will change, that we're, we're no longer going to be defined uh, by the sort of rubric of a majority culture, a non-Hispanic white majority culture, surrounded by essentially multicultural margins, but rather a culture that is multilateral, that is hybridized, that is intersectional. That's a term that we, we hear a lot, right? Uh, that is a reality that is about not just the influences that minority cultures have on a mainstream general market, but rather the intersections and in, in influence they have on one another. The show My Son is In, Fresh Off the Boat, has as its thesis uh, that it's a show about a, an immigrant Chinese family, immigrant Taiwanese family, that moves from uh, Chinatown, D.C. down to largely white suburban Orlando. 
but the lens through which it's seen is through a 12-year-old kid who has embraced hip-hop culture as his primary identification. So a, an Asian-American kid who identifies with black culture a, and who lives in a white neighborhood, right? That's a polycultural show. <laughs> it's, it's not a show about one or the other. It's about all and the above. Uh, and polyculturalism doesn't just reflect changes in the spectrum of racial and ethnic identities. It reflects the overall shifting that's occurring in the social landscape of America. Uh, an America that is going to, over the course of these next decades, become more populous, more urban. It's going to become older, right? We, we have a graying society. But in, in effect, that graying is actually uh, asynchronous. The, the aging of the white population is going to, to a certain extent, be uh, offset by the constant influx of new immigrants who are younger and uh, populations who are having more kids. You know, Hispanic, African-American, Asian-American populations who are continuing to have more kids. Uh, so that's, again, going to be one of the drivers of change in our culture. It's going to be more relig religiously ambiguous. And this is important because we're not just seeing challenges uh, of integration and acculturation and, and, uh, and, frankly, social justice that relate to race and ethnicity, but also Faith, and, and faith is, is a critical thing for us to consider in a world that sadly still is in many ways divided. Uh, what we're seeing though is that more and more we're gonna, we're gonna see a surge of people who are you know, unaffiliated with faith. We're gonna see a, uh, a decrease in the Christian population relative to other populations, uh, other faiths. Muslim and Hindu are gonna grow dramatically. Uh, and that diversity is in part driven by the diversity that comes from immigration the renewal spring, if you will, of American culture. 72.3 million people, or 18% of the US population, will be foreign born by 2050. That's staggering. Almost one in five people born abroad coming here because America is still and will be, continue to be, the destination the world uh, seeks to, to converge on. Uh, and within that, there'll also be a boom in our multiracial population. So we talked about intersectionality, right? Sometimes people are intersectional all by themselves. There's you know, increasingly uh, the reality that marriages in this country, one out of six marriages in America right now, are between people of different races. And that is going to continue to grow. And the very ways in which we define race and ethnicity are going to change as a result. So where does this take us? Polyculturalism, uh, as we define it, is a state in which diversity has become inescapable, a normative part of the everyday fabric of daily life where American identity is accepted as being shaped by a wide array of different influences which are multicultural in nature, pan-ethnic in origin, and transnational in context. In fact, it's the subject of what we've been talking about today. And um, the reason why this is important is because polyculturalism isn't just about headcount. It's not just about that majority-minority uh, population in the United States. It's about this notion that difference is value, that there's something powerful about the fact that we represent a tapestry of, of different perspectives and POVs, uh, different sources of creativity and innovation. We talk about color power, and color, of course, is just a, you know, a, a stand-in for uh, difference and, and uh, you know, kind of the, the spectrum of positions that exist in America. But the reason why TS, the Futures Company, has actually defined color power is because one of the things we wanted to do was clarify how, how much, essentially, the influence of multicultural America, polycultural America, is already having on our society. What we did was this. We said, all right, we know that you know, diverse markets in America uh, are large and growing, and growing faster than every other market. Just looking at race alone, 92% of the population growth in America came from black, Hispanic, and Asian American uh, populations over the course of the last decade, right? But market size alone, headcount alone, is not enough to truly gauge the influence of diverse communities. Diverse communities are also politically activated. We've seen that right now, right here, in this election cycle. The, most, the loudest voices, the most uh, critical uh, sources of votes have come from ethnic populations. Uh, the black vote, for instance, was transformative in this election. If it had not been for black voters, Hillary Clinton would not be the 
presumptive nominee for the president and probably, hopefully, our first female president of the United States. <laughs> um, but the very fact that the black vote has been shown to be so critical has led people to recognize that you cannot be elected in America again with only the white vote. And that is clearly a sign of color power. Propensity to spend. Uh, one of the things we've seen is that diverse communities are more likely to spend at different economic levels, that even when they don't have this high an income, they're more ready to actually unleash the power of the income they have. And that means that they literally ha spend more uh, than, you know, than their peers do, especially in critical contexts, in categories uh, where they over-index on consumption. And finally, cultural influence. Let's be real here. The trendsetters, the shapers of culture, are increasingly those coming from diverse communities. And that alone, the amplification effect that comes from the social influence, the digital influence, the, uh, the consumptive taste-making influence of these communities means that, again, they index higher than their actual numbers. That led us to create some, a, an actual index called color power. And what we found, given all these factors, was that diverse communities already punch enough above their weight, right? Uh, they, they have a, an impact that so outstrips their actual numbers that we already live, if in effect, in a majority-minority culture. I mentioned to you that you know, pop culture is kind of the, the indicator uh, that sort of harbinges these, these shifts that are occurring in, in greater consumer culture. And we're seeing that, again, even in, in how people are buying, what people are spending on. In music, Hispanics have been shown consistently to spend 27% more on music than, other, than the rest of America, right? 27% more on music. They own index strongly on live events, on digital albums, on online streaming. They're punching above their weight. In film, uh, people of color are right now around 37% of the US population, but we purchase 46% of the movie tickets. This is even setting aside global audiences, which we all know at this point are driving box office, are driving the profitability of movies. But just purely in the United States, almost half of all movie tickets, half of all box office is generated by non-white consumers. And Hispanics, in fact, were responsible for nearly 40% of the, the gigantic box office returns of the mega-hit Furious 7. Literally, that franchise would not exist if it wasn't for the massive fandom of the Hispanic American uh, car-loving, <laughs> movie-ticket-buying audience. And then television, obviously close to my heart, right? Uh, in partnership with Nielsen, and hello, Betty, I see you over there. Uh, in partnership with Nielsen, uh, I was able to run some analyses, uh, some breakouts on who is actually watching uh, this, essentially, renaissance of shows uh, that are led by protagonists of color, that center on non-white protagonists. And what we found was really fascinating. Uh, five of the eight most watched shows by African Americans, 10 out of the 10 most watched shows by Hispanics, and seven of 10 of the most watched shows by Asian Americans featured protagonists or significant ensemble players from their communities. People of color tune into shows that feature people of color at their center. It doesn't seem so you know, unusual or bizarre, but the numbers actually hold it up. The numbers actually show it. In fact, for the first time, what we've seen is, uh, as of the 2013-2014 uh, network TV schedule, for the first time, there are three shows whose viewers are majority non-white, which means the entirety of the audience that, that is watching these shows, right? the majority of that audience is black, Hispanic, or Asian American. And that has never happened before in history. Of course, the three shows are Empire, right? Empire because everybody watches Empire, hopefully. <laughs> uh, How to Get Away with Murder and Scandal. So what does this tell us? This tells us that if you actually build stuff for ethnic audiences, they will come. It's the field of dreams uh, idea, right? But we also have to recognize that the majority of the US population is, is still is white and will remain, you know, that will remain the case for uh, until you know, the next 20 odd years. And there's always been a concern that if you target ethnic consumers, you target diverse consumers, will you lose the rest of the consumer audience? And the fact is, that's not the case. Five of the seven most watched shows by non-Hispanic whites had ensemble casts featuring prominent black, Hispanic, or Asian roles. It doesn't mean losing white customers. Uh, 
what we've even seen in film, uh, this is actually recently uh, something that, that uh, was in The Atlantic, uh, an article about a research uh, that had been done by you know, you know, professors at University of North Carolina and McGill University that showed that not only do audiences not reject films with diverse lead actors, they actually prefer them. These films make more money. And in fact, that films with two or more actors of color actually outperform those with only one or no non-white actors by 40%, by, sorry, 60% at the box office. And then there's this. <laughs> now, I, I put this up there in, in part because, uh, you know, if you guys have not seen Hamilton, it, it, the, the number of days left to actually see it with the brilliant Lin-Manuel Miranda in the actual uh, lead role are dwindling. And I've actually been seeking to purchase tickets, and I've got to tell you, it's either that or the kids go to college at this point. <laughs> But the very fact that a, a show on Broadway, historically known as the Great White Way for many reasons, <laughs> uh, is the biggest show of our time is a show in which we've taken American history and revitalized it with faces that re resemble America's present is a brilliant, brilliant act, uh, a disruptive one. So let's talk about what to do. I mean, given the example of Hamilton, uh, given that we are living in a new America, an America defined by a polycultural identity. Uh, what do we need to do to actually you know, play to that strength? Uh, what we see is that there are, are really kind of six big paradigms, six big rules or guidelines that uh, brands of all types can embrace. And I'm gonna, again, show them through the lens of popular culture, but these all translate into things that brands can do. The first is this, bridge the gap and break the molds. Don't play to cliches, don't assume that the archetypes, not much less the stereotypes, of what America looks like are still the case today or still will be the case in the future. Uh, you see that, that picture there. Uh, it's actually from a show called Crazy Ex-Girlfriend on the CW. Uh, and uh, it's a fantastic show. It's terribly underwatched, really sadly so, but we love it, right? And one of the reasons we love it is because of Vince Rodriguez III, who, who plays uh, Josh Chan up there, right? The reason why we love that character is not just because he can sing and dance and he's handsome and he's great and funny and all that stuff, but because he plays an Asian American male who comes from a completely different perspective than anything else you've ever seen on TV. He is, in fact, an Asian bro. <laughs> and there was a long feature article, uh, I think it was in The Atlantic, that talked about if there, oh, it was in Vulture, sorry, New York Magazine, that talked about how if there's one thing that Crazy Ex-Girlfriend has done, it has exposed the fact that Asians can be kind of like, you know, uh, can, be, can be bros, you know, uh, brew drinking, exercising, <laughs> uh, you know, slightly meat-headed guys just as much as we can be anything else. Um, but that idea of thinking beyond that box and, and breaking those, those archetypes is really critical to connecting with a polycultural America. Embracing new protagonists. Now, this is something uh, that we've seen most recently. Uh, Asian Americans have been increasingly uh, active on the internet, essentially backlashing against uh, these episodes in which Asian characters have been cast with white actors, right? In which roles have been rewritten or recast so that real stars, quote unquote, real movie stars, uh, like the Scarlett Johansons of the world, uh, can play roles that were originally written as Asian American or Asian perspectives. Uh, so uh, online, you know, what this sort of social media phenomenon has occurred, uh, in which people are taking posters you know, for big budget movies, like London has, has Fallen and so forth, and recasting them with Asian American actors, starring John Cho, starring Constance Wu. Um, and that whole notion of, of literally just finding new ways to actually in include the voices, faces, and perspectives of a range of cultures is critical to, to unlocking what I call the poverty of creativity, right? One of the things we forget is that Polyculturalism doesn't just give us access to new markets. It gives us access to new ideas. When you tell a story with a different protagonist at the center, the story changes. Uh, I know I don't have a lot of time left, so I'm going to move ahead. But uh, just a, a, to put a pin in it, one of the most heralded new television series coming forward in the new season is 24 Legacy. It's an extension of the 24 franchise, which once starred Kiefer Sutherland. right? They've recast that role so that at its center is an African-American veteran of Afghanistan. And the entire storyline is about how in his 24 hours to save America, uh, he's actually you know, leveraging, essentially, his community, his culture, his family, all of which look different from Kiefer Sutherland's, uh, as part of, of his saving the world. 
And it, it's amazing to just show how simply putting a different person at the center of a story changes the story. All right, understand how to share culture by avoiding cultural appropriation. Yes, we want to be inclusive, but we want to be inclusive in the right way. Remember, when you actually take influences from other cultures, you can't divorce them from the cultures they come from. This is an example here. Uh, Oscar uh, Metzavat is a fashion designer who actually has taken inspiration from traditional patterns and fabrics and textures and illustrations coming from native tribes. But instead of actually simply appropriating them and then reprinting them and mass marketing them and making money, he's actually partnered with those tribes and taken a percentage of the profits and put them back into those communities and led them to actually help design these articles and artifacts, bring them in as partners, not simply as resources. Remember the color is not enough. Avoid the Benetton effect, right? Don't just include one of each in order to get the full spectrum. <laughs> Over here on the, on the right-hand side, what, what we saw, if you guys have been watching Master of None, and I, if you have not, you should. It's brilliant, right? There's, there's an, uh, an episode of it in which uh, the whole uh, conundrum of what happens when two brown people actually are cast in the same movie. Oh my god, two Indians. We can't have that, right? Uh, uh, you know, it's, it's something which, which Hollywood seems to, to fall into all the time, that, that if they have more than one person of a cer certain race, they're afraid that people won't be able to tell them apart, right? So they never do that. <laughs> but, but the fact is, right, if you look at TV today, you will see that there are many different kinds of brown, right? Many shades of brown, many different kinds of Indian uh, and Chinese and, and uh, you know, Southeast Asian perspectives that are now reflecting diversity, not just of color or ethnicity, but of identity, of character, right? Um, and that ultimately is where we're trying to drive. Uh, let consumers under the tent. This is just a sort of basic uh, notion that the more power at this point you give consumers, the more likely you are to actually understand where they're coming from and what they want. Uh, just an example of that, The Walking Dead, the biggest show on any TV, right? Cable, network, whatever. One of the, the really smart things they did was they put together a show called Talking Dead afterwards, which allows people to essentially engage in that sort of social conversation around what they've just watched. That's not per se and a, you know, a multicultural perspective, but when you actually look at what's going on online, socially, around television and pop culture in general, the conversation around a thing is just as important as the thing itself. So bring that conversation in. Embrace and engage it. And then keep America together. Now, what's important is this. People are looking back at history more than ever. But we're looking back differently. We're looking back through other eyes, right? Uh, some of the most successful examples of reviving the nostalgic aspects of American history have actually been about taking a look at those aspects of history from other cultural perspectives. Uh, FX and The People vs. O.J. Simpson, you know, incredibly gripping series, but also a series that invited people to really talk about and rethink a heated moment in American history from different perspectives. And then Roots. There's been some controversy over the idea of remaking a classic. But one of the things it has done is it has forced conversation about that classic once more and updated it in terms of the people and the perspectives that are you know, related within it so that younger audiences who might have missed it or not been born the first time around can connect with it again. So this is the last thing I want to leave you on. At the end of the day, like Soylent Green, for those of you guys who, who like classic cult cinema, diversity is people. It's people. And uh, this is a story which I tell people time and again about Fresh Off the Boat, the first show in 20 years to feature an Asian American family on network sitcom TV. Well, it would never have happened if it wasn't for the fact that really, literally up and down the pipeline, the decision makers were Asian American, were people who actually were cultural gatekeepers for the first time who got the story, who connected with the audience because they were part of it, right? Eddie Huang, of course, wrote, Eddie, celebrity chef, uh, memoir author, uh, wrote the book, literally, uh, that Fresh Off the Boat was based on. His friend, Quan Fung, and mine, uh, who used to be an executive at Fox and at Disney, uh, he ultimately in encountered um, the book and recommended it to Melvin Marr, right? Melvin Marr is the executive producer of the series, who had been looking for a while to do a show on, Asian Ameri on an Asian American protagonist, but couldn't figure out what to do until he saw this book and said, this would be a great series. He contacted Ninochka Khan, Persian American, uh, because they were both on a panel at an event like this, actually, a, a panel on multiculturalism, uh, and said, you know, you, you'd be great as a showrunner for this series I'm trying to do, called Fresh Off the Boat, about this Chinese family. And she's like, all right, I'm on. 
and she wrote the, the, the pilot for the series, and they presented it to Sami Kim Falvey, the head of comedy at uh, ABC. Sami, meanwhile, uh, said, we, we'd love to do this, but we need to find the right cast. So of course she turned to the head of global casting for ABC, Kelly Lee, Korean American woman also. And Kelly uh, not only found some fantastic, you know, overlooked veteran actors like Randall Park and Constance Wu, but also a bunch of kids who had never done anything before, like my son. <laughs> and, and the reason my son was cast, even though he had, had zero training or experience in the past, was because Kelly Lee literally said, he reminds me of my little brother. I've yet to meet her little brother. <laughs> but finally, the thing that all brings it back together, do you know who it is who actually presents at the upfronts this one moment when all of the assembled forces of ad agencies and media and marketing, communications and brands sit there and actually decide whether or not to support with advertising their critical product? <coughs> it is the head of sales, the head of global sales for ABC Networks, and that is Jerry Wong a Chinese-American woman, and if she had not endorsed this as something that could be sold to corporate America, Fresh Off the Boat would never have occurred. So all these people had to be in place in order for Fresh Off the Boat to, to happen, and they were there, and frankly, this, all of you, is the reason why this change is happening. So I know I've sta stayed my welcome a little bit too long, but thank you guys very much, and thank you for having me. So I was pitching questions, right? So we've got to have like one question. Does anybody have their one single question? Okay, she raised her hand first. <laughs> right here. Run, run, run. And uh, as the mic is going there, I also want to say one thing. Uh, Nielsen has some fantastic, some fantastic work uh, around Asian America and how it's changing and how its taste and consumption patterns are changing. And I fully urge you guys to actually go to their site, download it, search on Google, Nielsen and Asian American Report. Uh, their most recent report is, is a brilliant piece of work that shows a lot of what's uh, structurally happening behind the scenes with these changes. So please look into that stuff. I'm about to take the question, but hurry up. Okay, <laughs> <right>. <laughs> Quick. Sure. Chris. Cam Wong with Prudential. Hi, Jeff. Thanks for your very entertaining and informative presentation. So my question to you is, um, what role do you see crowdsourcing and individuals' ability to create their own video and film and just post it on YouTube? Um, what role do you see these avenues playing in diversifying and really increasing the color power? That is a brilliant question, not least because one of the truisms about the digital landscape, the digital creator landscape, is that uh, it is disproportionately Asian American. And there's a good reason for it, right? If you actually look at YouTube in particular, right, uh, among the top 10 creators and uh, most subscribed YouTube channels, you'll see a plethora of Asian and Asian American individuals. And what we've seen is, is that's a, a, an intersection of two forces. The first is this. When you're locked out of one room, you go to the next. Right? Traditional media for many, many generations has effectively told Asian Americans you don't belong here. So when you have smart young people who are educated and technologically adept, that's the other force, right? Asian Americans over, over you know, index on virtually every aspect of digital consumption and creation, what you get is a, a mass of people who basically say, all right, you won't let me in, I'll make my own. And that's what's happened on the digital landscape. What we're seeing is that those creators you know, although they aren't necessarily all, you know, kind of crossing over into traditional media, in many cases they don't feel like they have to. Uh, the funniest thing, uh, Hudson, right, who accidentally, like <laughs> just two years ago, fell into network television is now on, you know, uh, being watched by millions of people across America on a weekly basis. He constantly says, Dad, I really want to be a YouTube star. How can I do that? <laughs> So Sorry. if you have kids, check in with them. What do they aspire to? They aspire to be Ryan Higa, not Hudson Yang. <laughs> Thank you. Thank, Thank you very you. much. A round of applause. Thanks.